everyone on the call today. Thank you so much. Welcome. Uh, we're very happy that you decided to join this event with us today, which is uh, Meet the Press, a discussion with Stanford University Press, University of Chicago Press, and University of Texas Press, hosted by Dakota. Before I introduce our moderator for today's session, I would like to go over a few housekeeping rules. Um, that is, today's session is being recorded. Uh, we will be able to share a link to the recording post the webinar, um, and please feel free to share it with your colleagues. We also invite and encourage any questions, comments, or opinions that you have. Please input them at the Q&A chat box that you can see at the bottom of your screen. And we would also appreciate it if you would post the name of the organization that you are a part of or you represent, just so we can make sure that we cater the response to you. Um, and also one last thing, um, when you do post the questions, I will either post it to the speaker at the time, or we might hold it until the end of the discussion so we can make it much more interactive and engaging at the time. With that, I'd like to introduce our moderator of today's session, Michael Zioli. Michael Zioli is the Senior Advisor of Publisher Partnerships at Degreuter, and some of you might know him from YBP or Gobi, where he was the Vice President um, he was the vice president for publisher relations. Um, and right now he's a senior advisor for publisher partnerships at Dakota. Um, but more than that, most of you would know him probably for all the publisher meetings that he's held at Charleston, most commonly known as the ZOE Fest. Um, with that, I'd like to hand it over to Mike. Mike, the floor is all yours. All right, thanks very much, Anne. Zioli Fest, oh my God. I don't know who fed you that. It wasn't me, <laughs> definitely wasn't me. Um, well, thank you everybody for coming. I see we're, we're well up into the hundreds of uh, participants, so that's fantastic. You know, over the weekend, I saw a survey uh, online from Princeton University Press, uh, and they were asking people like, like us, um, what we knew about the press, it was a very short, but very good, well-constructed survey. And one of the questions was, when you think of Princeton University Press, what kinds of books do you think of? And I thought that was a great question because often when we think of university presses, we think humanities, social sciences. And that's often as far as it goes, you know, how specific does it get? Um, so I thought that this was a great opportunity here for people to actually understand more about the differences as well as likenesses and missions of the presses. When you look at these subjects listed on the, the sites of all these presses, you'll often see the same types of, of topics, you know, classics, uh, Latin American studies, Jewish studies, uh, immigration. But when you actually start looking at the books, they're all quite different and have a particular slant they're always, almost always interdisciplinary. So one of the things about De Gruyter's uh, uh, University Press Library and Initiative, which I think started in Charleston in those library publisher discussions, um, was to, to break down that wall as much as possible between the publishers and the libraries. Right now, the vendors, us, are kind of in the middle and prevent some of that communication. So we, we think that these, uh, these discussions, and this is the first of a series, will, uh, will foster that ability to, to know the, the presses better. Uh, De Gruyter has, has sought to build a model that's different from the typical business models that support the presses to an equal degree that the model supports the library's need for the research published by the presses. And that's what's different. It's not... Um, it's not a commercial enterprise. It's, it really is an effort to uh, support both sides in an even-handed way. Um, I also wanted to mention that, uh, and, and I know our directors here will uh, develop this topic, but out of all the English language scholarly publishing in a year, the, the books say handled by a company like Gobi, uh, 3,000 titles, only about 20% are university presses. However, that 20% weighs a lot more in terms of importance to library co collections and, and what users need. Um, the flip side of that is how important are libraries to the publishers? I hope that's a question 
um, we'll find an, an answer to or, or interesting comments on uh, from our group. Um, just you know, something about each of their books. Uh, one of the best books I've I've read by a university press came from Stanford. Stanford. Alan Harvey recommended it to me some years ago, and I say best because it, it hit my personal interest. Was Counterculture Colophon about Grove Press, who published a lot of the um, uh, subversive uh, literature in the fifties and sixties, and um, their their books that get published by these, these guys that aren't typical for your researchers. You, you find things of, of very varied interest. Uh, from Texas, there's a book coming out uh, on Dave Hickey, who's an art critic. I can't wait for that one to come out. He's uh, an irreverent sort and um, something I'm looking forward to personally. In fact, if you read the New York Review of Books, you'll always see pages uh, for the university presses in there, and I, I always look through and see what, what the new forthcoming titles are. That's the Texas page. Um, at the other end of the spectrum, there are local interest and popular sorts of books. So here's another Texas book, The Tacos of Texas. So there's something for everybody that these guys uh, publish. And of course, my own downfall was from Chicago. Um, this is the, the first scholarly book where my name appeared. And uh, it's been downhill ever since. So Garrett, I, I don't know what to tell you about that. Um, I'd like to read a couple of words from their mission statements and then hand it over to the directors. Um, so from Texas, you'll find this. They publish books that matter, books educate. Publishing good books is a public responsibility and a valuable component of higher education. From Chicago, you'll find that they publish serious works that promote education, foster public understanding, enrich cultural life, advance scholarly conversation across disciplines, define new areas of knowledge and intellectual endeavor. I think I'll, I'll leave it with that and, uh, and pass this off for our directors to talk a little bit each about their presses and by the way, when we get to the discussion section, some of their colleagues will also be joining us and we'll introduce them at the appropriate time. So uh, I'm going to go clockwise from my perspective. So Dawn, that would uh, put you up first and then Alan and then Garrett. So Dawn Durante, the, the editor in chief from University of Texas Press, Dawn. Um, it's a pleasure to be with you all today. A pleasure to be representing Texas. Um, and as Michael mentioned, we have some other colleagues from our presses that will be joining us later today. So um, I want to just heads up that Angelica Lopez Torres, my wonderful colleague, will also be joining us for the Q&A. Um, University of Texas Press is more than 70 years old. So we're just a few years away from the big 7-5. We aim to publish about 100 new monographs and books a year, and we have a journal, a, a growing journals program, uh, about 15 journals, one recently added, a couple in the works. Um, we have a staff of about 75 that do all this out of Austin, Texas. Um, so our publishing program, the books as well as journals, reflects the long-term commitment of the press to rigorous, high-quality scholarship, and what has always drawn me to the University of Texas Press before I even arrived, got the pleasure of joining them as editor in chief is their um, commitment to areas of regional, national and global and international importance. It's a, it's, a, it's a really, it's a focus list covering a lot of geographic and intellectual territories um, over a, a historic time span. There's excellent trade, like the tacos book that Michael just showed. We have beautiful photo books. Um, and so I wanted to talk a little bit about the editorial program and like the books that I'm excited to have on my shelves and that I would be excited to see on, on library shelves part of collections. Um, so regional, you might anticipate lots of Texas titles, um, very scholarly history, but also very trade but also more than Texas. We cover Western history, we cover food studies, uh, border studies, and then these link to things of, you know, the na in national debate and, and guys, uh, the American popular music list 
is amazing. There's a Music Matters series that includes books about um, Marian Faithful and also uh, Swan show. It's just really broad and really wonderful. Sports and culture, urban studies, popular culture with a really established comic studies list and um, a Latinx experience in history, which ties to um, our, our international scope as well. I had mentioned earlier, we have a classics list. Michael mentioned classics list. I love the classics list. It um, reframes our understanding of the ancient world through new modes of analysis in really compelling ways. Um, and we also have one of the most important collections of publications covering Latin American studies, um, history, anthropology, art, culture, really covering the gamut. So this is a, hopefully an overview of the, um, of the heart of the Texas list, but our program is always headed in exciting new directions. Um, we have a continued commitment to these established strengths. We're also building out lists in Black studies and feminist studies always honoring the foundation of the list at um, the intellectual borders, not only the geographical ones, but the you know, abstract ones, um, crossroads and intersections. Um, Michael mentioned that he hoped we talk about what we see as the importance of libraries um, in, the, in the publishing relationship. I think they're instrumental to our mission of getting books in the hands of as many readers as possible, right? Like the library accesses so many readers. We've seen the use of accessing digital collections through the last year. And, um, and so I also wanna say though that much of the discussion we might have today during the Q and A from the Texas side of things is gonna be framed through this being a time of transition for the press as we're rethinking things like our digital strategies. Um, this transitional period means that we can be a really flexible organization as we revisit and visit things that we're thinking ahead to. Um, it's also a part of what brings us here today. And we are maybe one of, if not the most recent press to join De Reuter. So I want to give my colleagues a chance to talk as well. So I'll wrap up here. I look forward to the Q&A later. Thank you. Alan, would you like to take up? Alan, your turn. Okay. Thanks, Michael. Sorry, you're, you're glitching a little bit, Michael, um, but hopefully you'll come back with us later. Um, thank you for inviting me here into all of your homes and living rooms and bedrooms and kitchens and wherever you happen to be. Um, I'm going to start by giving you sort of a little background on Stanford University Press. We were founded in 1891, which makes us exactly the same age as the university, because founding the press was actually a condition of acceptance of the job of the first president, David Starr Jordan. Um, and so the, the editorial committee that governs the press was actually established in 1891, and our first book was published in 1892 which actually makes us exactly the same age as Chicago. Thank you, Garrett. Um, and in fact, we hosted our 125th anniversary about four years ago and did a really deep dive into our history um, and found a lot of uh, rivalry between Stanford and Chicago with frequent flop swapping of staff and facilities, including the poaching of the Chicago press director, Donald Bean, in 1945. Um, <sighs> The Stanford only publishes books. We don't publish any journals. We currently publish about 125 books a year across humanities, social sciences, business, and law. We peaked at about 185 books in the in around 2008, and we've retracted a little bit since then, um, choosing to focus on our key areas. And we publish in three different imprints. Um, Stanford University Press is obviously our main imprint. We also have the Stanford Briefs, which is our short form publishing imprint. And Redwood Press is our trade publishing imprint that's about five or six years old. Um, we're a mid-sized university press with a staff of just 35. Um, and as with most university presses, we don't publish in all disciplines and we primarily break ourselves down into literature, philosophy, religion, history, Jewish studies, anthropology, sociology, 
a range of regional studies such as Middle East studies, Latin American and Asian, um, international relations, business, economics and law. Um, and we just completed a rather extensive external blind peer review of all of our publishing programs, um, treating each publishing program as if it was a new book. Um, and that produced some really, really interesting results for us because it was amazing to see uh, what others think of what we typically view as fairly clearly defined work. Um, it wasn't surprising that uh, disciplines such as history, critical theory, Middle East studies, Asian studies were the primary list that we uh, that we're well known for. But it was quite shocking to see how blinkered some people were to programs that are outside of their field. Um, the, the, the list that we're most proud of, I would say, at the press um, that tend to feature um, at the front of our catalogues of uh, fields such as immigration, um, Middle East studies, um, uh, Jewish studies, including our 12 volume, 20 year translation of the um, Zohar, the Jewish Book of Mysticism. Um, we've got a recent focus on terrorism with a, a QAnon explainer coming out in a couple of, in about two months. Um, and our history list has expanded into American history over the last couple of years. And our biggest selling book for the last two years has been um, an undergraduate American history textbook. Um, so uh, just to follow on from what Dawn said about, um, you know, with a breakdown of sales, because I know you're going to be interested in, in the, the relative significance of different markets for us. Um, Printed books still account for about 76% of all of our sales. Um, and these are numbers for the last calendar year, 2020. Um, it, we could consider that 2020 was an abnormal year, but I check these against 2019 and proportionately everything is roughly the same. Um, so 76% of our sales are, are printed books. We sell about 18% overseas outside of the US. Um, libraries, uh, used to be anecdotally about 35% of our sales. This was from the days before we had um, easy um, database access to all of our sales figures. Um, progressively each year that I've been monitoring, they've been coming down and down and down. Um, I would say optimistically right now, um, with a bunch of huge caveats, such as um, we know that libraries buy around, and we also know that some of what we perceive as library channels, such as Baker and Taylor, don't exclusively sell to libraries, but I would say that libraries right now are, are about 18% of our sales. Um, and two thirds of that is now digital. Um, this, is, this is quite a significant shift. Um, the uh, libraries have moved from publishing, from uh, purchasing just in case to purchasing just in time. Um, and so that shift um, has obviously meant a lot of changes for us within the press, but it's emblematic to me of a shift in the way that research is conducted um, and a shift in how books are used by researchers within their own work. Um, now that shift internally, we, we're a nonprofit, so we budget each book to optimistically break even if we sell every copy. So if two book sales become one because users or libraries share, then we essentially need to charge twice as much to be able to cover the costs of um, developing, signing, um, editing, and producing that book. Um, we know that that's not sustainable in the long run. Um, there are counterparts of ours in Europe who actually follow that model and will charge $250 a book, but we choose not to do that. Um, so we've had to shift our editorial focus and concentrate on where we can add value to this information chain. So our focus is now uh, more closely on individual readers um, for trade books or for course books and adoptions. We obviously still publish research monographs because that's part of our mission. Um, and it's necessary for us to maintain our network of authors, but it's becoming a smaller part of what we're doing. Um, let me just offer one big caveat for the numbers that I produced earlier and um, to our uh, it, to, to the favor of our current hosts. Um, the, the library numbers that I gave you didn't include our sales through De Gruyter. We're also a recent addition to the De Gruyter family. Um, and the revenue from De Gruyter sales didn't reach our bank account until January. And so over a period of roughly eight months, 
they've managed to double our ebook sales into libraries. Um, and so we're, we're really heartened by the work that they've been doing and by the um, importance um, of, uh, of uh, university press books to libraries, especially as they're uh, managing their collections during a distributed time. Um, let me just quickly add one other, um, one other topic you know, to one side of our regular book program. We also have a, a different um, program called SUP Digital, um, which is Mellon funded. It's been uh, running for about five years now. And the goal there is to publish born, born di digital work um, and in a slightly different way than other people have typically uh, referenced born digital. We're not take, talking about taking a book and making it digital. We're talking about taking digital research and making it available. Um, so what we're doing is taking the product of uh, digital humanities and digital social sciences um, that is typically an interactive product um, and uh, managing that as if it's a book. Um, so we do full peer review, full editorial development, user interface design. And we, we, we mirror every single process that we have for a book and we use that on these, on what we now call interactive scholarly works. Um, we assign an ISBN, we assign digital object in, um, identifiers, we register copyright, which um, give me 20 minutes and I will give you the nightmare of registering copyright of an interactive scholarly work. Um, Unfortunately, Library of Congress records for them are just as difficult, but we do register them for Library of Congress. And we also do a full archive because preservation is part of our um, uh, contribution to this. Um, and so by archive, I don't mean we put it on a flash drive in a drawer or back it up to Adobe Web Services. We actually ingest the content into the Stanford Digital Repository run by the library. Um, and we create an emulated environment using a WAP file so that these digital objects will be accessible forever in their native form. Um, and in fact, actually, we've blurred the line between archiving and publishing so that now we actually can't decide you know, when to make the archive live. Um, so this is an effort to actually embed ourselves within the, the flow of current scholarship. Um, and it's also using the skills that we have as a publisher to the best use of the current academic community. So with that, I will leave it and back to you, Michael. Thanks very time? much, Alan. And Alan, your, your uh, press reports to the library. You're, you're under the, the same roof as the... Not anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. We used to be part of the library. We've, um, some of you may have followed the trials and tribulations the last 24 months. I now report directly into the provost um, and uh, the provost and the chief budget officer. Okay, thank you. And uh, Don, before we move on, can I ask you the same question? Is the University of Texas Press a part of the library or is it independent? Dependent but we love collaborating with our library. Okay. System. Well, Garrett, uh, your turn. Uh, I'll answer the same question. I report to the provost, the press reports to the provost and always has. Um, the, I'm on the library board though, so I'm very closely connected to the University of Chicago Library. Um, um, thank you all again um, for, for joining us. Um, I also want to thank Steve Fallon, Michael Zioli, uh, Anne, and all the folks at DeGreuter for uh, putting this together and, and increasing the amount of communications between publishers and libraries. Um, uh, DeGreuter is foremost a, a publisher and um, they approach uh, our relationship, our partnership as a publisher and not just as a service provider. And I'll tell you that it makes quite a, quite a difference. Um, and it's, it's actually really important that um, we understand each other and, and moments like this where we can actually kind of just share some information, ask, ask questions of each other is really helpful. Um, as Alan alluded, uh, the University of Chicago Press uh, was founded around uh, 1890 at the same time as its university. Um, we, uh, the, the university was founded uh, with three divisions, a, an undergraduate division, an extension school, and the press. And um, this is not just a piece of trivia, it is actually key to our mission and our, our uh, identity. 
Um, there's a sense of ownership um, within the university for the press and the press has a sense of community and ownership um, to the university's mission as well. And I think that's really, really a, a very valuable part of what we do. Uh, we publish around 270 uh, new books per year. We have about 7,000 books in print. Um, we also publish 76 journals um, with around a third of those journals um, where the copyright is owned by the university. The other um, uh, two thirds are in partnership with societies, museums, um, university departments around the world. Um, we also distribute books from our Chicago Distribution Center and we have a full service digital service provider called BiblioVault. Um, these two operations um, together provide print and digital services for around 200 publishers, um, mostly North American based, but um, from around the world as well. Uh, I am in fact proud of our connection to my two colleagues here. Uh, we used to distri uh, distribute Stanford books and in July of 2021, we will start distributing Texas's books um, out of the Chicago Distribution Center. That's new news. Um, for, uh, for many years, uh, we've made uh, nearly every book, new book um, available simultaneously in print and online. Uh, the only reason we wouldn't do that for an ebook would be if the rights holder uh, did not give us the rights to do so, or the print book itself was uh, impractical in making it into an ebook. But those are very rare occurrences. So, by and large, um, everything we publish is available in digital format. Um, our, our journals have been fully online since the early 90s. Um, we were um, one of the first publishers to basically, you know, uh, make these available. Uh, on our own platforms, and we now uh, offer them on the uh, Adipon uh, Literatum platform. And um, we were an early supporter and contact content provider for JSTOR, uh, and we're still um, closely closely connected to JSTOR for our journals. Um, as with many other university presses, our publishing is rooted primarily in the humanities and social sciences. Um, Chicago is best known for its list in sociology, uh, particularly its uh, LGBTQ plus um, uh, list, which is um, uh, dating back into the into the 70s and 80s, um, uh, it was it was the cutting edge as far as that's concerned, and we still publish very heavily in that area. Um, anthropology, philosophy, history of science, political science, um, across across the range of disciplines in the humanities and social sciences. We also publish in the natural sciences and um, history of science very heavily. Um, our disciplinary strengths are uh, reflected in both our books and our journals. So we often have uh, uh, books and journals that are in similar fields, which is which is very helpful. Um, and those are rooted in the great strengths of the University of Chicago. Um, our our, our politi journal, Political Economy, we've published continuously since 1895. Uh, the American Journal of Sociology since 1892. And um, we have continuously published the Chicago Manual of Style since 1906. So. Um, uh, as Dawn mentioned, we, we publish across, uh, as university presses do, across the range of scholarly works. Um, many uh, specialized monographs are still the core of what we do. Um, only about 25% of our list uh, in any given year is our trade books. Um, the majority of our books remain um, scholarly monographs. And, um, and again, pricing is an important thing for us. Um, we, we've, we've managed to keep our prices within reasonable um, uh, bands and uh, and we publishing publishing more in uh, paperback and digital digital um, off the bat to keep those prices down. Um, just as an anecdote, um, university presses all have books that only university presses could publish, and um, and ours uh, is the the complete works of Giuseppe Verdi. Um, this was this program was started in the mid seventies um, and will extend for at least the next decade. Um, uh, at the end, all of all of uh, Verdi's musical works will be will appear in critical editions, um, and these are used for uh, performance and for education around the world. Um, I wasn't the director that started this program, but fingers crossed, I, I might actually see it through. So, um, I, Alan touched on sales. Um, I we have similar information. Um, uh, our, our our books, our sales to academic libraries are a key part of what we do. Um, they make up about 12% of our annual sales, um, but um, that's everything. And our, 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 our backlist is, is um, our main driver of our sales. About 75% of our sales are backlist um, versus frontlist. Um, so those would be books over a couple of years old are backlist. And libraries don't typically buy backlists as much. So, um, but, so libraries make up about 25% of our sales um, of frontlist. 
So um, our largest market remains the retail sector, including course books um, through Amazon, through college bookstores, independent bookstores, and direct to consumer off of our website. Um, a surprising number of people come to our website um, to buy books directly from us. And uh, though there are easier ways to get them um, through Amazon and others, we, we deeply appreciate that they come to us. Uh, in journals, everything's reversed. Um, uh, about 80% of our revenue comes from um, academic libraries. Um, and um, the, the rest comes from um, uh, rights deals, arrangements with um, uh, ProQuest, EBSCO, etc. Um, uh, and we are a large publisher of journals uh, for a U.S. university press, but we are very small compared to Oxford and Cambridge. Um, and we're absolutely minuscule compared to um, Elsevier, Wiley, Springer Nature, Taylor and Francis. Um, we have to attract society journal partnerships um, through our super superlative service mentality, a reasonable approach to pricing, uh, and the understanding that as a division of a great university, our missions are somewhat aligned with those societies. So um, that's that's a that's a key selling point. Um, if we're if we uh, are asked to put money up front to to get it get a journal to come to us, we tend not to be able to play that game. So, um, in summary, Chicago's core business uh, model hasn't changed drastically over the last 130 years. Um, as I said, we were originated to disseminate the, the work of the Chicago faculty to the world. And though we no longer publish only from the University of Chicago faculty, uh, we remain committed to publishing high quality books and journals that reflect uh, the values of our university. So um, that's all from me. And uh, Michael, over to you for any questions. Great, thank you, Garrett, and uh, thanks all of you. I think before we start into the, the discussion section, which is now, I'd like to invite your colleagues at the presses to join us. So uh, uh, Levi, Krista, Angelica. <laughs> I see Krista. Hello, Krista. There's Levi. Hello, gang. Hello, Hi. Levi. Angelica. Here I am. Angelica. Listen, let me, before we begin uh, the discussion, just ask each of you to introduce yourselves briefly. Uh, your job, years at the press, uh, something like that. Krista, can you start? Uh, I'd be happy to start. Uh, my name is Krista Colson. I'm the Senior Manager for Digital Publications and Metadata at the University of Chicago Press and have just hit my 10-year mark with the press. Levi, let me bump to you. I, Michael looks like he's glitching again. <coughs> I'm Levi Stoll. I'm the Marketing Director at the University of Chicago Press and I've been there since 1999. So it'll be 22 years very soon. Hi everyone, I'm Angelica Lopez Torres. I'm the International Rights Manager at the University of Texas Press and I'm about to hit my eight year mark here. Angelica, um, I, I noticed that at Texas, I hope everyone can hear me. Um, there's, there's a Center for Middle East Studies and I noticed that you're publishing a lot of literature from the Middle East. Is that uh, under your purview or is that Dawn's or? It's it's a really different, unique. It's that's unique. a different editor, uh, Jim Burr. He's one of our senior editors. He handles that. Um, but yeah, it's a partnership with the, with the Center with, of uh, Middle Eastern Studies here on campus. It's one of our great um, partnerships. I think that's one of the opportunities of this meetings because I think when you think of Texas, you don't think of that kind of publication and it's really excellent. Um, let's move to the questions though. Um, so it's not just me talking. There was a, uh, two questions here. One is about a uh, backlist, and this is uh, connected with your digital um, uh, sales. I think, Alan, you mentioned that two thirds of your library sales are now digital. Mm -hmm. um, are you noticing in the library sales that as content has moved online and models have evolved, that more of your backlist is selling? And I'm thinking of the just in time instead of just in case. Libraries aren't required to buy the new titles, but if they have a demand-driven acquisitions pool or use evidence-based acquisitions, older titles 
are discovered and purchased. Uh, I just wonder if you have any insights. I wish I had some deep insights. Um, I'm just rapidly looking through the tally of, of numbers. I don't have the breakdown of um, the digital library sales between backlist and frontlist. Anecdotally, I know that um, the, that um, there's been steady and growing backlist sales, and certainly one of the uh, one of the big the impetus is to purchasing through De Gruyter is the availability of the complete archive. We, um, we've had a very cautious approach to um, making backlist titles available in digital form because of rights restrictions. Um, we, at, like Garrett, we, we've since about 2007 published everything simultaneously in print and digital, but the backlist has been slower to migrate because of the massive task of clearing third party rights, um, but we have a single case exception for De Gruyter. So we, we pretty much made the entire backlist available through De Gruyter, and that's spurred a lot of, of interest in sales. Thanks, Alan. Um, anyone else care to talk about the, the backlist uh, changing as, as digital models become prevalent in libraries? Okay, uh, I'm sorry. I, I I'll I'll jump in there. Um, I I think as as Chicago has um, is is not a press that has all of its backlist fully fully digitized yet. We've actually we took an approach that um, uh, we we originally made as much of it as we could um, and the and the most popular titles in a way uh, available. We're digitizing more and more of the backlist, so we are seeing we are seeing growth as far as that's concerned by just having them available. But um, one of our key um, uh, uh, working arrangements with with De Gruyter is actually to completely uh, uh, digitize the backlist to make it make that fully available. So we anticipate that that'll be an important part. Um, pu publishers have generally um, accepted the fact that that libraries have purchased much much of these works uh, in print. Um, and may not want to purchase them again for uh, full prices. So we um, we try to be as flexible as we pop we possibly can to uh, discount them to offer you know special collections or deals or things like that that actually you know are are um, fit the budgets for the libraries. Can I ask about the uh, the cost of publishing a monograph, uh, Alan? You talked about, uh, or I think maybe it was you, Garrett. Uh, you publish books that that a commercial publisher like Taylor and Francis or Springer or Wiley Elsevier, et cetera, wouldn't touch. Um, and it's part of your mission. How do you think about uh, sustainability when you have this list of whether it's 130 titles or 250 titles, um, uh, what you can publish, what you can afford to publish? Are there limits? Are there times when you can't publish? There's, there's definitely times we can't publish, and it's, it, um, but that's part of the, that's part of the um, art and the contribution that we bring to this. In that, um, you know, uh, I've been at Stanford for coming up twenty years, and before that, I was fifteen years at Cambridge, and Cambridge is is also a nonprofit, not a commercial publisher, but still. And I, in order to support the size of the organization, there were certain um, there were certain factors that went into the decision to publish e each book. And, and um, it was very similar to, to, to the methodology that you would use a, a, a commercial publisher. Um, we have a very, very different set of metrics. Um, I have a team of seven acquisitions editors and, um, and they are tasked with balancing their program. They each know that, that they can get away with doing several passion books that we know are not going to be profitable, but are necessary for the field and make the job worthwhile for them um, because there are other portions of the list that will actually make money. I mean, there was a period when a lot of the discussion that's um, outside of Stanford, but about Stanford, was that we were publishing business books just to turn a profit, to subsidize everything else. Um, that's not true, but I can't deny that the business books do turn a profit. Um, and I can't say the same about some areas of our philosophy or anthropology list, but they're no less important to us and they don't get any less resources. 
Dawn, do you care to talk about balancing your list in terms of uh, you know the financial costs of publishing versus um, uh, the importance of your of of the books to your mission? Yeah, there there are always hard decisions to be made, and you know we have this trade off of mission of getting scholarship into the hands, you know, distributing it as much as we can, but we also have to stay in business in order to do that. So there is a, a give and take at every hand. Um, but one thing at Texas is that there are several endowments, which the precise reason for them, the gift that they are, is they make it possible to do some books in some areas that we wouldn't be able to do otherwise. And so that has, that means like when I mentioned earlier that we have some beautiful photography books, these co the cost of producing that book on their own would not be a, you know, a bottom line <laughs> possibility, um, but there are ways that you, you know, presses become creative to try and make some of those things happen. But at the end of the day, you, you do have to make the tough decisions and just the way libraries are making tough decisions about what they acquire for their own collections. Um, you know, we have to make decisions about what we're acquiring to, to try to publish. Barrett, can I can I get you to weigh in on that? You have a huge list. Um, yeah, I, I, I think I mean that we're always we're always balancing things, and I'm looking at some of the questions that are in that are in the um, uh, the chat here as well, and they kind of touch on this because um, you know that has to do with um, you know what what proportion of our books are course books or what you know what are our thoughts as we as we acquire titles. Um, you know, we 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 publish for the long term. That's a, that's an important thing. Um, you know, though we do publish trade books that are that are maybe you know sort of of the moment. Um, we tend to publish books that um, will be around for a long time. A vast majority of our titles um, are in print for uh, more than a decade, and um, and that's that that doesn't seem like that long, but but when compared to with, with a lot of trade publishers, it's very different. Um, and um, you know, we do think about we we try to balance uh, the, the efforts of the editors as far as um, uh, their disciplines. What are the needs of their disciplines? Sometimes a textbook is not needed uh, or not used that much, and therefore it's not that not necessary to um, to have. Um, but you know, we want to make sure that the that the books are available to um, individuals as much as we possibly can, and. Um, uh, that, that, that again is a very different um, scenario than from my background um, in, in more commercial scholarly publishing, which was aimed almost 100% uh, at the library. And we kind of said libraries can afford to pay something higher than, than what individuals can. Chicago's rationale tends to be the other direction. We tend to look at what individuals might be able to purchase. Um, and um, so that's a, it's just a different focus in a way. So. Um, all right, thank you. Listen, the uh, the questions are mounting, so let's try to tackle a few of these. One is about uh, your engagement with your libraries on campus. Uh, a, a couple of you had mentioned being on boards. How do you engage with your libraries? And you know, coming from a vendor background, I think about we the vendor are that wall between you and libraries generally. So how do you uh, leverage having a, a library next door to inform what you do. I'll jump in on that. Uh, let's see, let's start with Dawn and uh, okay. just to change up on her. Um, so I joined Texas in August. So in terms of like literal collaborations, um, they have been some, um, I'm on a, a committee about open access subcommittee about um, some work that the library is doing um, but I'm really excited for like things to open up, be non-pandemic, to like get in library and see what it's like. I love a good library um, and all libraries. And so, so in terms of the, the collaborative efforts though, what I understand as is how many resources and how much I've already learned from some people in the library system at UT um, and um, Angie, maybe you have a, some thoughts on maybe some of the more historic collaborations that have e existed. Um, but, but for me, I think that what we realize is that we're all part of the same ecosystem. We are all stakeholders in making sure that scholarly communications 
get access by readers, by scholars, by students, and how can we all think about the challenges we're facing independently and work for answers together in the big picture sense. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just jump in. We've we've had some very great collaborations with some of this, the libraries on campus, to name a few, uh, the Briscoe Center, the Blanton, and the Harry Ransom Center. We've um, been able to publish books from their collections, from things that they've had, and been able to produce these gorgeous books through that collaboration. So I think um, we're always looking for these these types of partnerships with, with our um, libraries all the time. I can add something to that from Stanford's perspective. We um, so we used to be part of the library, um, and while we were part of the library, I actually sit on the, sat on the library board, um, and I found that to be incredibly, incredibly useful. Um, and it was a real two way street. It meant that I got a deep insight into into the um, the priorities and struggles within the library, but they also got to see. Um, a, a different publisher perspective because publishers tend to be lumped together. People think mm -hmm. of publishers and they have a view of, you know, Elsevier or or Oxford or um, Random House, and um, we operate very very differently. And trying to actually educate them about how we operate, you know, was initially a challenge and then a joy. Um, and I, I'm grateful that the connections that I made there have actually outlasted us being part of the library. So, um, you know, we still regularly socialize and I attend their meetings you know, when I can. Um, yeah, and I, I, and I mentioned that uh, I joined the library board um, when I first joined Chicago 13 years ago. And uh, so I have always been the longest standing member of the library board um, because our, our librarian, uh, um, we got a new librarian at uh, about five years ago, um, and Brenda Johnson has actually now just announced her retirement, so um, we'll have a new librarian, um, and I'm on the search committee for that new librarian um, with the university, So, um, and I was on Brenda's search committee as well. So I, um, again, as uh, the, the library reports into the provost, um, uh, the library and the press share the same liaison um, with the provost office. So we, uh, we're talking to the same people. So we understand each other's um, budgetary issues and uh, other issues all the, uh, as well. Um, as far as collaborative works, um, we don't do that much, frankly. And we are always sort of saying, you know, we wish we, we, wish we did more, but um, we, um, and we certainly provide, provide all, all of our publications to the University of Chicago. Um, uh, and we ensure that all the digital platforms um, that um, um, uh, we work with uh, provide provide uh, that access to to our books as well. So we're kind of giving the library a break that way. Not always not always what our what our partners appreciate, but um, uh, otherwise they it's it's an important it's an important thing. I see uh, a couple of uh, questions here. One from, I believe, a colleague, unless there's another person by the name of Timothy Wright. He would be the director of Edinburgh University Press. And also from Louis Hull, who's at McGill University. And I think those questions are related, but from different sides of the coin. So let's try to pull those together. And Krista, you might be one of the people to respond to this. Um, we'll start with Timothy Wright's question. He says, as ebook sales continue to grow through the aggregators, um, there's a challenge obtaining detailed sales data. And uh, what, what are your views about the availability and quality of such information? Uh, are you getting uh, all the information you need from the vendors? And uh, is it helping inform your decisions? What describe some of that to us? Uh, it depends on the ebook vendor that we're working with. Um, among the major aggregators, um, there's one notable platform that gives us uh, no information about which institutions are purchasing our ebooks. So that's a, a giant blank spot in our ability to assess <laughs> sort of regional trends. Um, certainly, working with, uh, with someone like Degrader, the smaller uh, aggregators, we get much more information and um, I actually have an opportunity to get a lot of questions answered, <laughs> which is very nice. Um, one of the other source spots for me, because I'm always trying to look at the market overall, 
uh, and look at the way that the different vendors are working and if we need to adjust our strategy in different sales models um, is uh, purchasing trends over time. Uh, and that's another place where I think there's a lot of weakness in reporting, um, particularly in sales models like uh, DDA, EBA, short-term loan, um, in uh, models that, are, that require multiple transactions to trigger a purchase. <laughs> Um, and especially ones where our, uh, the share of revenue that we get decreases uh, as a title gets older. Um, those are our trends that are extremely difficult to monitor. We just don't get much detail um, of sales and definitely not in a standardized way that make it at all possible to consolidate for cross regions. Levi, I see you nodding your head. Do you have something to add to that? I know we've we've met in Chicago to talk about these issues uh, more than once. Yeah, mostly thinking what Krista was saying about the trends in buying, it be it would be really good to have a better grasp of that, of of how librarians and patrons are viewing things like DDA and and how they're, especially in the past year, as the shift to digital has become necessary rather than preferred. Uh, as patrons are not in the building in a lot of places, um, not necessarily always having access to that information is is a feels like a screen we can't see through. Let me let me offer one tiny little counterpoint to that. Um, you, we've all, we've almost always sold our books to third parties, um, and so we've rarely had a deep insight into who our customers are. Um, and the the prime example of that is Amazon. Uh, we have no idea who they've sold to. We don't know whether it's a library, an individual, um, a corporation. And, and as of last year, Amazon's 44% of our business. Um, and so that giant black hole you know, <laughs> overwhelms the smaller black hole of where books are going in within libraries. But that doesn't, that doesn't mean that I'm not interested in it. I'm, I am incredibly interested in, 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 in the trends of buying within libraries. And you know, getting any data back on who our customers are is incredibly useful. Yeah, and I think one distinction there is that we sell to Amazon on essentially two models of print and e. And yeah. the library world, it's an endless proliferation of possible models and yeah. getting a path through that of understanding. That's the part I find harder. Yeah, yeah. And Alan, and to Alan's point, um, we've always, we've always existed. Baker and Taylor has never told us where they sell um, <laughs> any of their books at all. Um, so we've never ever heard. That any one of you, um, so so places like, um, you know, we 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 look on we look online, uh, you know, OCLC kind of data and whatnot to try to figure out where our books are in libraries. So it's it's it is a is a bad uh, overall bad data field. Yeah, but also to 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 emphasize Levi's point, um, the the pro and I'm sure this is opening up Pandora's box here, but but the proliferation of sales models. You know, the evidence-based acquisition, short-term loan, you know, whatever you want to call all of the different models, we are as confused and frustrated by them as I'm sure librarians are. Um, and we are presented with them um, in, in different guises from each different aggregator. Um, and we have no, no way to assess um, the usability of them from the library's perspective or the revenue stream for us. Um, and we've fallen into several traps in the past because of that. That's really interesting. You know, since uh, digital tech technology appeared for books, you know, over the past 20 years, the proliferation of models and the confusion. And uh, in some recent discussions I've had, you've seen some of those models, although they're still there and available, they're obsolete. Mm -hmm. But uh, they, they live on somehow. Listen, there's a question here um, uh, from Harold Colson, who asks, since all three presses are working with De Gruyter, uh, they'd like to know what percentage of your titles are available title by title versus what, what percentage are available only in a collection? Let's maybe just take your front list. And uh, do you know that offhand? I know for for Stanford and Texas, it would be in the upper 90%. It would be a, a lot. For Chicago, uh, with the, the breadth of your list, I, I doubt that it's quite that high. 
I, uh, I could take a stab at this. I will uh, declare ahead of time that my understanding just changed on Friday uh, when, when I learned that the new Degrader platform uh, doesn't support single user titles anymore. So our previously available single user titles on the old Degrader platform that were purchasable title by title are now collection only uh, as part of that technology shift. So I'm, I'm gonna say now, probably 60 to 70% of our titles are available title by title purchase um, just for that reason. Um, right, and the, the Degoida model is right to strike a bargain between the publisher and the library where the publisher is going to give the best terms, DRM free, uh, make everything available. And the flip side is the library is going to purchase the entire list. That won't work for every publisher, but it, it will for the university presses uh, that DeGreuter works for, depending on your library and the mission. Um, there's a great question here about uh, course adoptions. What, so when you're acquiring a title, how does the, the possibility of course adoption factor into your decision making? Um, do you want to take that, Dawn? <laughs> I think I think course adoption is unpredictable and becoming less and less reliable and likely, and so it factors very little into most of our acquisitions decisions. Um, you have to presume. I think it's generally safest to presume that a book is not going to get course adopted or very minimal. And you want to think about what the reality of the book is doing in like the marketplace, its intervention and scholarship, the void of that aspect. And then if it does get course adopted, it's like, you know, icing on the cake or you get your cake and you eat it too. But the reality is, is that even during the peer review process, you know, one of the questions often asked to the peer review guidelines is the potential for course adoption. And reviewers might say this, yeah, there's so much potential. I could see it used in this course, in this course, in this course, but there's only so many books that instructors can use and whatnot. So the short answer is, uh, I would say it factors very little in the majority of book acquisitions decisions. I know that De Gruyter studied this issue in trying to get publishers in the early days to put all their books on the platform for the collection. There were a lot of concerns about course adoptions and the study showed but it was very unpredictable and scattershot. What would be adopted at one university was completely different from another. Um, would, would Garrett, Alan, Levi, care um, to respond? Yeah, I could, I could say a bit. I mean, I, I, I think to Dawn's uh, point, the, uh, the number of times that authors will mention that their books could be used in courses is, is much higher than, than the uh, amount that they are, are actually used. That said though, that we, we have a, again, from a data standpoint, trying to figure this out um, um, is, is difficult, but uh, the lag time sometimes when a, when, a, when a book becomes used in courses is, is quite considerable. And, um, you know, anthropology is a good example where, um, you know, books, books that we publish in one year, it'll take five years before that book might get established as a textbook uh, and used in courses on a, a regular basis. And, Publishers um, today are only printing sometimes, you know, for a first six, six to 12 months of the book life, and then they go to print on demand. And then there's all these other things happening because of inventory um, uh, charges and whatnot. But, um, you know, we, we have to take a long view on these books with the potential that they may, that they may actually get taken up. Um, and that affects marketing, that affects, um, you know, how we approach conferences we attend and everything else that, that goes on. So, um, it's we we may discount it at the beginning, but it is a real part of what we do, and a lot of our sales are through college bookstores for books that we would not consider to be college uh, course books. They just are books that, you know, professors have heard about through review, reviews, et cetera, and they and they use them. And and it's, let me just you know, be pedantic about semantics. I mean, um, there's course adoptions. There, um, it's it's. Putting together two words that we use differently. So we at, at Stanford we refer to course books and textbooks as two different things. You know, textbook is that the, the course is defined around the book, and a course book is a book that is used in a class, and usually it's three or four books, and that's been changing drastically over the last ten years. Um, um, students no longer buy the four books that are recommended for their class, um, and 
as a result, the instructors no longer use all of the book. Um, they tend to use a small piece of it. And that um, uh, Sarah asked a question about um, selling chapters. Um, as best I can tell, there's no market to sell chapters because the instructors who are using those chapters take that chapter and they use it online. They're using the 10% exemption to, um, to take the PDF and put it on Blackboard. Um, and so what used to be a, a sideline of course revenue for some of those books no longer exists. But to Garrett's point, the long tail for a lot of our paperback books is a small level of course use um, for the interested student, for the graduate student. Um, and so that actually, that's the cream that we look for. Can I ask, are you withholding fewer titles from digital availability because of the course adoption thing? No. You're not withholding books? Or not really. I mean, there, there, are, there, are some, there are some real key textbooks that we do. Um, but I mentioned our history textbook. Um, that's open access. It's available online for free. Everyone can get it. Um, and yet it's still our biggest selling title. Well, listen, we're over an hour here. I see our audience is starting to <laughs> wane. So uh, I, I think we will have to wrap up and it's too bad. There are great topics left uh, like open access and vendor data and library collaboration with all of you. So uh, we'll do that in our next conversation. All right. Thanks everybody for joining us. Uh, this is the first of a series and thank you to our panel. Thank you. Thank you. Bye everybody.